sterilm fidei. Morten tu anunciamus homine. Father, Son, Holy Spirit, Amen. Okay, we're going to begin with uh, a council, what a council is, and then a short historical background on, uh, uh, on some of the councils, important councils, and some of them you would be familiar with, even though you may not know about the council or the date or anything else like that. Okay, so the first thing is the, uh, the uh, calling a council, having a council in the church, is rooted in scripture. Okay, it's found in the Acts of the Apostles. Uh, and they met uh, the, the apostles and the, the words that the presbyters or priests met in council to discuss the matter of whether Gentiles coming into the faith would have to become Jews and then Christians. Okay, so that was kind of the, the issue. And Paul and Barnabas left Antioch and went to Jerusalem to have that uh, have that discussed. And they did meet in council. Peter was the head, and uh, they had a discussion. Uh, then they agreed that the uh, Gentiles coming in did not have to become Jews, that is, be circumcised, etc. Okay, and then when they agreed on that, they had a letter that was sent out to the church in Antioch explaining what the church had decided in council in Jerusalem. So that's the uh, second part of a council. Not only did they meet, okay, they decide, but then they issue some sort of statement that resolves that, okay. You know, in our case today, the issuance are in, in Vatican Council II, they issued 26 documents, four of which were constitutions. Two of those constitutions were dogmatic, which is the highest teaching authority in the church. Uh, we have a dogmatic constitution. You must submit both your mind and your will to that authoritative teaching. Okay? So it's not a, a document that's discussable. It's only discussable so you can get to know it better, but it's not discussable where you can accept some things and not accept others. Okay? Uh, so that's what a council is. Uh, in the church, uh, they've had 21 ecumenical councils. Ecumenical meaning, at that time, it was, it's worldwide. Okay, that's what that means, ecumenical. Okay, but the first council is the Council of Jerusalem. That was not ecumenical in the sense of a worldwide council. It was a council for a particular uh, topic, for a particular uh, moment in time in church history. Okay, so while there are 22 councils uh, uh, that the church has had, only 21 are ecumenical, because the first one, the Council of Jerusalem, was not ecumenical. Okay, so if you put out your two uh, pages that you hand out that we have there, and we'll go kind of through those very briefly and very quickly, just to kind of get a sense of the background. Okay, so the, uh, as I mentioned, the first council of the church was in Jerusalem, okay, and that was in the year about 49 A.D., okay, and the whole question was in uh, whether the Gentiles had to become Jews in order to become Christians, okay. Uh, and again, that's not an ecumenical council, but that was a council of the church at first. And that sets the tone of the church A meeting in council, what the format is, okay, and then uh, what, if anything, they're going to produce. So in the councils in the church, they have four possibilities of what they do. Okay, one is to clarify the deposit of faith, make clear what the church teaching, teachings of uh, scripture are, Second is to explain the natural law, the natural moral law, to make it clear, more clear. Uh, the third thing is to uh, institute, uh, reorder some of the discipline in the church. Okay. And the fourth one is to initiate or continue uh, a reform within the church. So generally that's the four reasons why a church will go into council. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, and so uh, the first council, again, as I say, it's found in Scripture. That's its roots, and that's the church operates from Scripture. Okay. And so if anyone says, well, is this just a, a committee meeting? I'm thinking, no, it's not a committee meeting. It's not a democratic process. Okay. Uh, uh, only a pope can call a council, okay? and only he can deter de terminate a council, and only he can authorize okay, whatever publications are coming out. So just by way of background, with Vatican Council II, Pope John XXIII had called it, but he died uh, before the council was over. Everyone was wondering whether Pope Paul VI okay, would continue the council because he did not have to continue the council. Okay? He determines whether the Pope determines whether they're going to kill it, what it's called, or whether it's going to be terminated. Okay? 
Uh, the other thing is that the Pope has to sign off on all those documents. Okay. So, for instance, on the uh, dogmatic constitution on the church, there was uh, Pope Paul VI would not approve that constitution unless they had what they call a nota previa, a no prior to the constitution clarifying certain aspects. And what he wanted to make sure that everyone understood that collegiality among the bishops is not democracy. Okay. What it is, is that the Pope and the bishops in council together act collegially, but it's not a democratic process. The Pope calls the council, terminates the council, approves what's going to come out of the council. And only the Pope does that. So the Pope can act on his own, or he can act in concert with the, uh, with the bishops in council. Okay. That was one of the, uh, uh, in Vatican Council I, those two, uh, primacy of the Pope and also the infallibility of the Pope, okay, were declared in Vatican Council I. So when the Pope uh, sits in the chair and makes an ex cathedra statement, he does not need the support of the bishops. He simply does it because he's Pope, okay. Or he acts in council, uh, in collegial, uh, uh, gathering with the bishops, and that's in a council. Okay, so we want to make sure we're clear, clear on that. So these councils are not a committee meeting. It's not a, you know, a national caucus. It's not a meeting of the Republican Party or whatever. Okay, it is a, it's a holy, sacred uh, uh, work of the church under the auspices of the Holy Spirit. Okay, with a hierarchical structure of pope calling the council, approving in the bishops in, in collegial action with him. Bishops cannot call a council. They could not call a council uh, and say, well, we're going to have a council and uh, we'll see if we like what the Pope's doing. Right. Uh, it, it doesn't work that way. Okay. As a matter of fact, after Vatican Council II, there was a movement uh, among some bishops around the world that they call Vatican Council III because they didn't like what went on in Vatican Council II. Right? I'm just saying it doesn't work that way because we kind of, most of us have a democratic view of things, okay? Uh, one man, one vote. Okay, so then the first uh, ecumenical council of the church was a council of Nicaea. Uh, and that was held, uh, actually it was held in Bithynia. Uh, which is in, uh, in the Roman Empire, I'm doing it very quickly, the Roman Empire had split, okay, Constantine had taken over to the e eastern, uh, and then Rome uh, was, remained the western part of the Roman Empire. So this was held in the eastern of Byzantium, okay, and Pope Sil uh, Sylvester and the Emperor Constantine, okay. There were 300 uh, bishops there, Pope Sylvester was not there, but Hotius was his representative, okay. In here is... Uh, a very significant council that was held again in uh, three uh, was it three twenty five right that creed that we profess every Sunday is come out of the Council of Nicaea, so that creed is seventeen hundred years old okay and the church has professed it now what was issue with that was the uh, uh, was the uh, Arian heresy Arius a priest was teaching that Christ uh, okay was fully human but he's not fully God. Okay, he was like God, but he was not fully God. Okay, so Athanasius then uh, had uh, pleaded the, the bishop, and they held the council on the, to, to resolve this question. Okay, uh, and so if you look on that handout about the topic, and then you say the divinity of Jesus of Nazareth. Okay, and then you have the Greek the homo ousios, right? And homo is simply the prefix meaning the same. So if you have homosexual, it's the same sex. Okay, and then usios is kind of the substance. So what the issue is whether the Jesus of Nazareth was fully God and fully man. Okay, and the council says no, he is fully God and fully man. So that's why at the words at the uh, uh, in the creed, when he said he uh, became incarnate of the Blessed Mother, okay, and through the power of the Holy Spirit became man, we bow our heads because that was the essence of the Council of Nicaea, whether this Jesus of Nazareth was fully God or fully man. Okay, so that's what that council was about. Okay, and they had some other uh, thing, but you notice there was 318 bishops at that council. Okay, now obviously. Today, it's a lot easier to get around and get together, and so a lot of the limitations on bishops being there were their availability, the means of transportation, and all that kind of business. Some of them which could not even travel because they were not permitted to travel and things like that. The next one is kind of interesting is the Council of Constantinople, okay, is now it goes back to the Trinity, whether this Holy Spirit is a distinct person in the Trinity, or is this kind of just the Spirit of Christ? 
Okay, and so at that council they declare that the Holy Spirit, uh, and we have qui sumo adorata, is with the same is adored the same as Father and the Son. So there are three distinct persons in the uh, Blessed Trinity: one God, three distinct persons. Okay, and that council is 150 bishops. Then the next one of, of any uh, significance for us, okay, it was the Council of Ephesus. Okay, and that's Pope Celestine the first, and there there were 220 bishops. Here it became whether Mary was the mother of God, okay, and therefore it was declared infallibly that Mary is Theotokos. Theos is God, and she is the God bearer. That in her womb she bore the living Son of God, God the Son, and allowed human flesh him to take on human flesh through her. So that's why Mary then is always held as a mother of God, even though she's always perpetually a virgin. So she's both virgin and mother. And that's what that was declared, okay? So these are issues, okay? And then moving up a little more in time, the Council of Trent, okay? That's an important uh, council for us because it's in our time in the sense uh, of, uh, of, uh, of, uh, of its uh, years, okay? So that was in 1545 mm -hmm. to 15. 63, it was the longest council. Five popes presided over that council, okay? And that all had to do with the Protestant Reformation, or better said, the Protestant Revolution, okay? And that's where all the dogmatic uh, teachings came out of that council. It's the most fruitful council in the church in the sense of the work that it did and uh, how that really affected uh, the world. So, for instance, the first time there was a uh, universal catechism published, the Roman Catechism. Uh, uh, and that uh, stayed in place until John Paul II published his in 19, uh, was it 82, 92, whatever, I can't remember. Okay, uh, and so that catechism place, some of us are a little bit older, have been brought up in the Baltimore Catechism. Mm -hmm. The Baltimore Catechism is nothing but an excerpt out of the Roman Catechism. Okay, and so the reason they did that uh, is because of all the errors that were floating around. The second thing that they did, okay, is they put together for the first time in the Roman Rite one missal. So they published the Roman Missal, okay, and that has been in place until we just got the new one uh, just recently, right? We got a new English translation, but it's the same Roman Missal, okay. So again, those are the works of the Council of Trent that endured for 500, uh, 500 years, okay. And then Vatican Council II kind of uh, not updated, okay, but opened up uh, some of those uh, uh, made them more accessible because the church had fallen into a defensive mode defending uh, the errors of Protestantism. John uh, 23rd Carla Council says, no, we got to get out, we're supposed to be evangelizing, not simply sitting in a defensive mode defending doctrine, okay. Okay, and then there was Vatican Council I, okay, uh, and that was uh, held in Rome, and it was Pius IX, and there, there were 700 bishops. And there they discussed uh, the primacy of the Pope, and also the uh, infallibility of the Pope. Uh, that council got called short, okay, uh, that it was still for all the way up to 1908, they finally decided that that council is done because of the political uh, problems in Italy at that time. That's when they were overthrowing the, uh, the, the kingdoms and that's when they uh, forced the church into the Lateran Treaty where it only became Vatican State, okay. So uh, that's the reason that uh, council uh, never concluded, okay. But in that council, they had scheduled the topics that are brought up in Vatican Council II. They were going to discuss them. So the, part, the, part, the topics that they discussed in Vatican Council II did not just fall out of the sky. They went all the way back to Vatican Council I, okay, where it was supposed to be discussed, and they never had an opportunity to do it, okay. Uh, so then there's Vatican Council II, and I think on the back you have a handout. Uh, it's a, a little statement I wrote, and if you want to maybe follow along. Uh, it talks about Vatican Council II, the truth. <clears throat> so on January uh, 20th, uh, 1959, Pope John XXIII decided to call the 21st Ecumenical Council of the Roman Catholic Church, Vatican Council II convened on October 11th, 1962, a truly universal council of the Catholic Church was held for the first time. This is the first time where, via transportation and all this business, that we could actually get all these uh, bishops to come together in one place and meet in council. Okay, so in that uh, first council, there was almost 3,000 bishops that showed up for Vatican Council uh, uh, too. 
and they were from 79 countries. And so this is what they mean. This is really the first ecumenical meeting, worldwide representation in the church. And that's what makes Vatican Councils II so dramatic, okay, is that it wasn't just a kind of a few bishops here and there, okay. This is truly uh, a universal council, okay. Uh, and they assemble in the Basilica of St. Peter to participate in that momentous council. I have a Life magazine that I, uh, they've had, and in the middle they have uh, a whole section on this Vatican Council because that was a great historical event. And in the center page, they have the picture of all the bishops lined up in St. Peter sitting down with their mitres and, and everything on. It's really striking to see so many bishops sitting under one roof okay, at St. Peter's. Just a sense of really, there's a real first ecumenical council, right? So a major undertaking of both the historical and institutional church, okay, meaning by that, how would you like to be the guy that has to organize and plan and set up, uh, you know, all these bishops for a council, right? I mean, just think about meals, right? Poto toilets and whatever, right? Uh, and so a major on a historical church, Vatican Council II, exercised supreme magisterial authority by confirming in contemporary terms infallible dogma and explaining more fully moral and social teachings as they relate to modern culture. Conciliar documents, especially constitutions, are of the highest teaching order in the church, and therefore they are of grave importance for the church as a whole body and also for every individual baptized member. Dogmatic constitutions, for example, <coughs> require of the baptized full agreement of the mind and complete submission of the will. In his opening statement to the Council Fathers, Pope John XXIII gave the reason for his calling of Vatican Council II, and I quote, the greatest concern of the ecumenical council is this, that the sacred deposit of faith should be guarded and taught more efficaciously. And keep in mind now, they went through a retreat, uh, a defensive mode, defending thing. We're supposed to be out there teaching the faith. Okay. With the following statement, that Supreme Pontiff convened Vatican Council, and he said, transmit the deposit of faith pure and integral, without any attenuation or distortion. So that's what the council was supposed to do. That was the charge given to them, the fathers, by uh, Pope uh, uh, John the Twenty-third. In a magnificent demonstration of Episcopal collegiality, two popes, John the Twenty-third, he died, and Paul the Sixth, and all the bishops present at the various sessions of Vatican Council II <coughs> published sixteen documents. Four of which were constitutions. That's what we will do in the four constitutions. Two were dogmatic. Okay, the uh, dogmatic constitution in the church and the dogmatic constitution on divine revelation or sacred scripture. Uh, the other, uh, excuse me, the other pastoral, the church in the modern world, and then uh, the uh, last one, the constitution on sacred liturgy, uh, allowed a, a limited reform of uh, uh, as liturgical practices in the Roman Rite. So first, the November 21st, 1964 dogmatic constitution on the church, the Council Fathers defined in unambiguous language the divine nature, hierarchical structure, and human character of the Catholic Church, recalling with profound humility both the God-given evangelical mission of the apostles and also the ecclesial status of each member of the mystical body of Christ. And we're going to get into that because this is the council the first time they acknowledged the laity and they talked about the special vocation of the laity. So this was, a, that was, just in that alone, this was a remarkable council, okay. Then second, the uh, November 18th, 1965 dogmatic constitution on divine revelation, okay, the unfathomable and fathomable treasures of sacred scripture were opened once again for Catholics. And after the Council with all, after the Council of Trent, there was all, with the invention of John Gutenberg Press, there was a lot of funny Bibles running around. Okay, so we were given the Bibles, but we put it on the desk and you didn't read it. Okay, one of the great gifts of the Council now is reopening sacred scripture. Everyone now is more familiar with the sacred scripture. They're not afraid to read the Bible. They're not afraid to read excerpts. They're not afraid to, you know, participate in mass and things like that. 
the Catholics to read, study, and where applicable, put into practice. Then third, the Pastoral Constitution on the Church in the Modern World, December 7, 1965, the precarious condition of and, and, and pervasive problems of modern culture, such as the dictatorship of a relativism, says Pope Benedict XVI, were described with precision in the response of the Council of Fathers of this dehumanizing condition in the problems that attended was one of a faith-filled joy and hope. The title of this constitution is entitled Gaudium et Spes. Gaudium is joy, Spes is hope. Now here's the Catholic Church in probably the most horrible times after World War II, okay, the whole business of secularization stuff, and the church is declaring joy and hope. It's an incredible, incredible sense of who you are as church as opposed to what's going on in the world. And then fourth, in the, uh, 19, uh, in the December 4th, 1963 Constitution on the Sacred Liturgy, Pope Paul VI approved a limited reform in the liturgical uh, life of the Roman Rite. One year after the close of Vatican Council II in 1965, Pope Paul VI commented that church history shows that it takes at least 50 years for a council to be implemented correctly. The year 2012, okay, is the 50th anniversary, okay, of uh, Vatican Council II, and to date it has not been implemented correctly. <clears throat> to energize his call for a new evangelization and the need for what he calls, it's an actual uh, quote of his, emergency education, in his apostolic letter, Porta Fidei, that is door of faith, Pope Benedict XVI announced a year of faith. The year of faith will begin on October 11th, 2012, and it will end on November 24th, 2013, the Solemnity of Christ the King. The starting date uh, of October 11th was chosen by Pope Benedict XVI for two reasons. One, it is the 50th anniversary of the opening of Vatican Council II by John, uh, John the 23rd. Okay, 50th anniversary. And then number two, we're talking about emergency education, it is the 20th anniversary of the presentation of the Catechism of the Catholic Church to the world by Blessed John Paul II. So as mentioned in the English title for the apostolic letter calling the year of faith is Door of the Faith. That uh, title comes from the Acts of the Apostles. And I quote, Paul and Barnabas called the church together and reported what God had done with them and how he had opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. So that's where that title comes from, right out of the Acts of the Apostles. Right? Uh, two points must be made on this. First, from what that short quote, you can see that God is the actor in evangelization. Right? And it is God who opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. Right? what God had done with them and how he had opened the door of the faith. So God is the actor in the evangelization, right? He is the one that opened that door. Okay, and second of all, okay, the door of faith at that time was open to the Gentiles who were either non-Jews or pagans, okay? Today, due to the de-Christianization, the door of faith has to be opened up to the de-Christianized. Okay, so thus Pope Paul VI, uh, Pope Benedict XVI, put an emphasis on the real meaning of the year of faith when he declared that while the new evangelization is directed at emergency, quote unquote, cultural conditions, it must begin for us with a re-evangelization of ourselves. The bishops uh, in America who went over to Father Rod limited their visits to Rome, he addressed them and told them the new evangelization has to start with ourselves. We have to re-evangelize ourselves to make sure that we know what we're talking about in order to evangelize others. So the new evangelization, the Pope says, must begin with us. And therefore he says, we have to, and he said this again to the bishops, uh, United, the bishops from the United States, and rediscover the Catholic faith. So we have to be re-evangelized in order to rediscover the Catholic faith. But Benedict XVI is most serious about the need for a re-evangelization, re especially of the baptized living in secularized countries like the United States of America. 
by re-evangelizing ourselves, the present Holy Father is confident that the basic tenets of the Catholic faith can be rediscovered even by those who suffer from the three wicked eyes, ignorance, indifference, and indolence. Every baptized person then should know that the Catholic faith begins with the first Christian mystery. That is the most blessed Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. The primacy of this mystery is confirmed by Jesus of Nazareth himself. In the concluding pa uh, passage from the Gospel of St. Uh, Matthew, our Lord sets forth neither a recommendation nor a suggestion. He issues a divine order. A command, go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And behold, I am with you always until the end of the world. I'd like to just take a moment and just kind of run through that little passage, okay, so we get a sense of what it is, okay, and very briefly. Number one, go is an instructive order to proceed forthwith as in a traffic light that colors green as opposed to a yellow cautionary light. And yellow is used specifically like cowardice, lack of backbone to get out there. And Number two, make disciples of all nations means to recognize, to evangelize, and to catechize everyone. Baptizing in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit constitutes the essence of the triune God. Three distinct divine persons in one only God. Teaching them all I have commanded you is an order that must not be disobeyed, either in truth or in love. And last of all, behold, I am with you until the end of uh, the world, assures both those in authority and those who are called to obey that the ultimate authority is the obedient one, Jesus of Nazareth, or Jesus the Christ. So in the church, neither human weakness nor the prevalence of personal sin can destroy or derail Holy Mother Church. So in sum, there are four basic mysteries which I have mentioned, the Trinity, the Incarnation, the Paschal Mystery, and then the mystery of the church. So if we do not focus on the essentials, how do we rediscover the Catholic faith that we profess each and every Sunday? Furthermore, how can we re-evangelize ourselves and consequently evangelize others in what the Catholic Church believes, teaches, and lives? Okay, so this is the reason that we are offering uh, these four Wednesdays on the four constitutions so we can begin because that's the, uh, the authoritative, latest authoritative uh, teachings by the church, on the church, for the church. And so that's why we're getting together, hopefully that we can uh, evangelize ourselves by getting to know, or dis rediscover, or discover the faith in a more fundamental, basic way. Okay, thank you. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen.